like to see how they write about it. Because it's, it's pretty well written. Yeah. What is it? Um, we get, we get six copies. We just made six copies, but we only pulled four of them. Who else wants a copy? Okay, let's look at the homework, and let's 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 uh, see why it's so long and hard and so on. Um, I think the last three problems of the um, homework have to do with theorem A. Am I going to be able to use this? blue pen? Going to be visible? I really, I couldn't, there weren't any black pens in the office today. Well, so, let me see how this one's good enough. I'll use this one. Yeah, that works. Is this lecture 13? Yeah, I think so. There is a theorem in section 4.4 called theorem A. And that's going to be used for the last three problems. Let's have a look at theorem A first. It states this simply. The expected value of y is the expected value of the expected value of y given x. What does that mean? Just interpreting it, just interpreting the symbols is, is one of the problems, okay? Where ey given x equals little x. Those two things, you have the condition Conditional expectation of y given x equals little x. Yeah. Does that imply the expected value of y given x is just y? No. no. It does not. Because the average of y, let's, let's have a look at a little, exa a little example where this is some h of x okay, equals the integral y, f, y given x, y slash little x dy. Okay? So what you're saying is that is that this is the expected value of H of a capital X, where well, X is a random variable. So what you're saying is that the expected value of Y is the expected value of some function of X. Where that function of X is defined as the mean of, as the conditional mean. So let's have an example. Let's look at problem 67. Where we can um, in the in the text. Let's see if we can make sense of it. What page are you on? Um, 67 in the text is uh, page 172. I gave you most of the other applications of this theorem. <laughs> okay. Yeah, the three, the three, the three problems that I have, the last three problems in your assignment, uh, homework six, have to do with this theorem. So uh, apply in 4.66, 4.72, and 4.75. Okay, 
Let's have a look at 4.67. See what the egg is, is there in the state. And then we'll go back and we'll prove it and look at it a little bit more. A random rectangle is formed in the following way. The base x is chosen to be uniform 0, 1 random variable. So x, the base, is uniform 0, 1. Okay, that's a rectangle. Then the height, y, given x equals to x, okay, is uniform on 0 to x. Here, we'll just parentheses here. Okay. So whatever x, so that is, um, that means you're not going to get a square, but you're going to get a rectangle that's shorter than it is wide. Okay. You're not going to get a square, you're just going to get something that's the bottom half, you know, the bottom part of the square. Okay. You are going to get a square. You won't get a square. No, you never get a square because you never get x. You never get the top. You never get all the way to the top. You'll get nearly a square. Okay, you can get nearly a square, but I'm always, the height is always but can you? But you still can get x, right? With probability zero. <laughs> okay. So it's, 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 it's like this. This is, this is x, okay? And then this height is x, and you're just going to get something below that. Okay? So you're going to get a rectangle. This is the y. So y is less than or equal to x. Is what, and so there's a dependency going on here. Use the law of total expectation, which is this theoretic law of total expectation. It even tells you to use it in this problem, so this is definitely easier than the ones I gave you. But now I'm telling you to use, apply this law, okay, in these three problems as well, so hopefully that'll make it a little bit easier. Apply this law to actually compute the expected value of uh, the circumference and the area of the rectangle. Let's just try the circumference first. What's the circumference? Circumference would be 2x plus 2y, right? So that's a simple little business. So how do I find the expected value of the circumference? The expected value of the circumference. Let's see how the technique works. This is a technique. What you do is you condition. Okay. Is the expected value of the circumference given x is the expected value of the expected value of the circumference given x. Do I have too many parentheses? I think I have too many parentheses. That's the law of total expectation. Why did you why did you why did you say gonna, it's the uh, expected okay. value of two x plus I can do that. two y. Yeah. But I'm going to, but it tells me to do this. Okay, so then I will go ahead and put in c equals 2x plus 2y. I can either do it first or second. I just told you to do it uh, afterwards because they hinted me to do this conditioning argument. So condition on x is the whole point. You've heard of law of total probability, right? You haven't heard of total total probability? Yeah. Um, we've done it. You just don't remember it. Okay. Um, if I want the probability, for example, if I want the probability, what's the probability that y is bigger than? Um, half. Okay? How would I do that? So the law of total probability, let's just remember that. If I want the probability of y is bigger than half, I would say, well, I'll condition on x. Mm -hmm. That's the probability that y is bigger than half 
and given that x is equal to x times the probability that x uh, is in x to x plus dx, and then sum, integrate that. We've done that before. Okay? So I put f of x dx in here. Alright? This, of course, is the density, uh, which is just 1 dx, because I have uniform 0, 1. Okay? What is the probability that y is bigger than f given x is equal to x? Well, see, y is better dependent on what x is. x has to be bigger than a half, because y is less than, we'll see, y is less than x. Alright? So, let's see how I compute this conditional probability. Um, so, so x better be bigger than a half in order for this to even make sense. So this is integral. x goes from a half to 1. 1 dx. And the probability that y is bigger than a half would just be that x minus a half over x. It's, it's just proportional. y is equal to 1 over x. What? How did you get that? Why greater than? Well, because because here y is is between zero and x, right? Right. Okay. And then I want and then one half is in here somewhere. Okay. Oh, I said x had to be bigger than half. Mm -hmm. It didn't make any sense out of it. Y is less than x. So then it's just and y is uniform at zero x, given that x, right? So then it would just be this ratio of this to this. Okay? Just ratios. X minus half over X minus zero. Okay, maybe that's easier to read. Okay. One DX, and then you can just do the integral. Okay, you'll get half minus or half log. Okay. Let's see. Plus a half log two or something like that. Minus a half log two. <laughs> okay. Anyway, you get something like that. So I can calculate the total probability that y is bigger than half. This is the same idea. Use condition. All right. So now actually I can find the total expectation by condition. So what is? So I'll just put two x plus two y. Okay, now how do you compute that? Well, a conditional expectation is still, it still satisfies the linearity, okay? Because really what I'm doing is, okay, well, given x, what is the expected value of 2x plus 2y? Two it'll be, well, it'll this will just be conditional expectation of x given x and conditional expectation of y given x. You know, add them up. Is that this, a con this, expect this conditional expectation is still an expectation. This See this? Linear? This is an expectation. Yes. So would the expectation of 2x given x be just the same as expectation of x given x? Because what, what is the conditional expectation of x given x? Y. X. So this is like a constant. This is like a constant for that. So fix this is a constant. This is what you think. This is a constant. This is fixed here. You're just integrating against the density. So what you do is you fix this as a constant x. Okay. And you compute this function h of x. Then you take this function h of x and you replace a little x by a capital x to take the expectation of that. Because really it's iterated integration. That's all it is. In other words, 
the way this works out, what is the proof of this? What's the proof of this? Or maybe you should look at the proof. What you do is you calculate the expected value of y as a double integral y fx y dy dx. Okay? That's the proof of this theorem. A. I'm going to write this as a double integral. Why can I write it as a double integral? Because if I integrate out x, which doesn't affect this y or anything here, let's just get the marginal density of y. So I can always write out the expectation as a double integral or a triple integral or whatever. Okay. Now I'll write that. I'll write the joint density as a product of the marginal density times the times the times the uh, conditional density. So y given x, y x, and then I'm going to f sub x of x, the x. And then I'm going to have the I'm going to put the y integral on the inside, the y, and I'm going to put the y here for this integral, and then this integral. Okay. So there's the conditional mean of y given x. And then I take its mean, which means I take that expression, my h of x, and I integrate it against f of x. So there's the proof. But why do you put f of x outside of the integral? This is the y integral. This is going to be conditional expectation of y given x. Mm -hmm. But f of but f of x couldn't it be function of y instead of x? Because hmm? like x. Okay, here now now I'm, now I'm replacing. Okay, now so now I'm going to apply it over there. Okay. So now. I'm going, to see, I'm going to, I need to calculate this integral, right? I need to calculate this integral in general. And so here, I need to calculate this. This is a slightly different problem, because this is a sum of two random variables, all right? But it's obvious that if I'm treating x equals little x, which is what I'm doing here, this little x is fixed. And then I'm taking this expression and integrating against little f of x, uh, against f of x, all right? So I fix the little x, so that means that this condition, like, this is just a constant, and this is the uh, 2y, all right? So this comes out to be 2x. When I write this out, I can think of fixing the little constant, but then I take and put the little constant back as capital, okay? That's the way this method works. I don't want to write all the integrals out. It's too messy. So the technique is you, you fix this in your mind, and then you unfix it in your mind, okay? When you're done computing, all right? If you've done the inner integral, then you unfix it, and you just put it back to with the E notation. E notation just means integrate against f of x dx for the outer integral. So what this really means is that this is the x, x integral with respect to x, this, and this is the integral here. Um, I'm sorry, that's not it. This is the integral with respect to x out here. Okay, and this is the integral with respect to x and y if you want. Okay, uh, or, or, or y. Okay, over here. All right. Um, so really, you have two variables. You have a double integral, and I'm breaking it into two pieces, iterated integration. So the E's mean different things, all right? But they do mean average. Um, this last E just means average whatever is left. This first means this first condition means it says because of the vertical sign that I'm going to freeze x, all right? So that means I'm going to do the conditional density, all right? So it's confusing. What's this double E? Don't they mean the same thing? E is E. E is an E is an E is an E, right? No, it's not. Not quite. Because of this vertical line here in this parentheses notation. So you have E dot X, okay, versus E dot. Okay? So those are two operators. Alright? Two different operators. One uses a conditional density, the other uses whatever is it just takes the expectation. Um, whatever variables are left, you integrate over all of them. That's what this means. Okay. This means freeze one of them. Okay. Okay. 
So that's the notation, and it is a bit wild. Okay, so take a look to digest. This is uh, two e y given x. The linearity of expectation. So I'm using so this because so the conditional expectation. If this had been two x to the fourth, I would have got two x to the fourth here again because x was a constant. All right. So this just was a constant with respect to this inner integration. Okay, and this outer e just means with respect to x now because everything is a function of x at this point. So e of y given x, you can think of it as a function of x. What function of x is it? If they're going to tell me in the problem where I should be able to compute it, what is the e y given x? No, that's the density. Huh? That's the density. 1 over x is the density of y given x. 1? No. It's just half the way between 0 and x. The uniform variable is You have a uniform variable, right? This is the density. Okay, you just take it in the middle. Okay. Oh, but e of y given x. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. E of y given x. Okay. All right, I want to compute that. So x over two. X over two. So now I finally find this expected value of two x plus x over two. So actually, this proof, this solution is going to be pretty much by notation and this theorem, because at the end of the day, now this is five halves x. But x, the expectation of x is one half. Is it two x over two? I'm sorry, I forgot my two. Okay, so, so that's three x now. Okay. Yeah. So it's kind of the circumference has come out very intuitively. This is the expected value of three x, which is three times a half. Okay. So it's, in other words, you expect. This rectangle will be about one half wide and about one quarter tall. So you get three quarters times two, which is three halves. Intuitively, that's what the expected value should come like this. Now, does it work out for the area, though? That won't work anymore. Quite that intuition isn't going to work. It's not just going to be one. It's not going to be one half times one quarter for the expected area. Understand what I'm saying? So how's it going to work out? What's the expected area? That's a little bit harder to problem. Or it's seemingly a harder problem. What is the area? Now, let's take the area function. Maybe it will work out. Let's see. Let's see. Maybe it is one half of one quarter. <laughs> let's see. I don't think so, though. Now, let's just see how that works out. So I'll, I'll supply the same law of total expectation one more time. How do I do the expected value of x times y? So if I take area, area equals x, y, right? So I now want the expected value of the area. So that would be the expected value of x, y, given x, and then expectation outside. So I'll just do both steps at once here. of the conditional expertise. So condition on x. It's better to condition on x than y because I have this information. I have the initial distribution of y given x. Which is what I'm going to need to use. So now again this time, again x is a constant in this inner expectation. The inner expectation x is a constant so I can pull it out. So this is x times the conditional mean of y given x using linearity. So I'm just pulling this one out because it's constant. It's like pulling a, uh, pulling a variable across an integral sign when it's not involved in the inner integration, right? The inner integration involved in y. I just pull the x out. Maybe the integral x, y, blah, 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 blah. Okay? So, 
you have that, and this again was just x over 2. We worked that the same as before. So this becomes the expected value of x times x over 2. Alright, so it's one half the expectation of x squared. Okay. Now I have to do um, the expectation of x squared. Well, that's a very simple integral. Integral 0 to 1, x squared dx. This is 1 half times integral 0 to 1, x squared dx. 1 dx, because I have the uniform variable. Uniform density. The density is 1 from x. So I actually have to compute the expectation of x squared. And that is a third. So I get 1 half times a third. Okay. So that is the law of total expectation and the theorem. Yeah. I still don't get why you're pulling the x out because isn't it expected by x given x1? Okay, let's try this. What is this? This is simply since x what I'm doing is I'm doing double integral xy. I'm going to write it this way, f y given x, y given x, times x of x of x, dy dx. It's a double integral. All right, I'm writing the joint density this way. Uh -huh. Okay, now do the inner integral right here. Uh -huh. Okay, actually, I should pull f of x out. Oh, it's coming in play. Who's on me? X is not involved in inner integration, right? So I have this. All I'm saying is, this is the conditional expectation of x, y given x, right? Well, this x isn't involved in this inner integration. I just pull it out here. Okay. That's exactly what is being done. So, but what is this is ey? What's left is the conditional expectation of y given x. But what happened to that x? Of, oh, that's the expectation of, okay. So you see how you do it with the capital letters? This is the shorthand, that's the longhand. This is longhand, okay? This is shorthand. You leave the capital, you just work with the capital things. Now maybe the, there'll be some that you can't do, you know, um, but see that you can take you know, algebra, if you can multiply out and use algebra linearity, you can get through a lot of, you know, get some good functions. Uh, if you had e to the xy, then you'd be in a little bit of hotter water, right? You'd have, to, you'd have to actually compute the conditional mean of e to the, you'd have to, if you had, ex, if you had expectation e to the xy, okay? then you would have to do, then what's the conditional mean of that? You're going to integrate it. Yeah, you're going to have to integrate it. What this is, this is, um, x is a constant. So I'm going to basically do, I'm going to have to find the expectation of e to the uh, x times y, where y is uniform on 0 to x. So this would be the integral, 0 to capital x, I think of x as a constant now, okay? Uh, the density of y is 1 over x, so I get e to the xy, 1 over x, dy, okay? So, and where x is fixed, I'm sorry, did I, get, I forgot if I put my y in. I need to, this is just a, this is, no, this is right, this is the, uh, the function of y. Yeah, that's right. So I need to put the y in here, all right? This is the, the density is 1 over x on 0 to x. I put it in capital X instead of little x. So it's the game of the little x and the capital x. Now it looks like I've just completely reversed that. Yeah, I'm trying to find the expected, you know, but, so I get the, the little y in the capital x. <laughs> Right? So I guess 
that make sense? This is my function. It's not y times 1 over x dy. Because the function is not y. It's e to the x y. Alright, so I do this. So what would I do? I would say I have to anti-differentiate e to the x y with respect to y. So I get a 1 over x e to the x y. So now I get 1 over x squared integral over to x. This is not integral to x, but um, e to the x y. 0 to x. So I'll get um, something 1 over x squared e to the x squared minus 1. Right? Something like that. Right. So that would be a conditional mean. Now, of course, the mean of that would be a pain. You know, I won't be able to do that so easily. <laughs> okay. But it is computable. I mean, it does exist. I mean, if this does exist, I just won't be able to do it. So now, if I want to find the expected value of this, I just won't be able to find it close to one. I might use a, I use a power series or something like that to do it. Okay. This would be, I could expand this as e to the a is 1 plus a plus a squared over 2 plus a cubed over 6 plus a to the 4 over 4, 4 factorial plus so on and so forth. And I can cancel, this is e to the a minus 1 is then a plus and so on. The a's will cancel, I can write this out as a power series and I can integrate from 0 to 1 to get the expected value of x1. So this is an application this law again, just a little bit harder function, right? Okay. Well, that's the conditional expectation. That's the conditional expectation. All right. So it comes out as a function of x. And the law of total expectation tells me that let's just take the expectation of that single, a function of a single variable. Then the average will be skewed 
up toward this higher end. Okay? So I have something like this, and I think I came down here, and so on, and so on, like that. Okay? That was the condition of being y given x. Something like that. Make sense? The average is pulled down over here because of all these dots down here. And maybe I should just do it with a joint density, make sure we can actually compute the thing. So if I give you a joint density, suppose a joint density example, um, joint density is that f of x, y equals x plus y. Zero less room for x, less room for one, zero less room for y, less room for one, and zero else. There's a joint density. Find the conditional mean of y given x. So I'm trying to say I've got one of these pictures now. Go ahead and compute it. Well, that's the integral of y against the conditional density of y given x dy. Okay. What is the conditional density? I have to find the marginal density of x, right? So the conditional density is f y given x, y given x equals the x equals f of x y divided by the marginal density of x. So let's go backwards and actually see if you remember how to. This is going backwards a little bit, but. Let's just do it. So, what is the marginal density of x? Marginal density, I have to integrate out y. So, maybe I'll put that up here. Marginal density of x is integrate out y, x plus y, let's say dy. y goes from 0 to 1, apparently, independent of x. Okay? So, then this comes out to be x, y plus y squared over 2 y goes from 0 to 1, and you simply get x plus a half. 0 less equal to x less equal to 1. So that's the marginal density of x. So this comes out, therefore, to be equal to x plus y over x plus a half. x plus a half, and that's for y between 0 and 1. So this is the, x plus a half is the right normalization constant. So depending on what x is, you get, I mean, you're just getting a linear density, right, as a function of y. This is just a linear function of y for each fixed x. It doesn't look linear because of the denominator, right? But for each fixed x, it's just a linear function of y. So you get a, you'll get a, a trapezoidal kind of picture, right? So for y is between 0 and 1, and put on the y-axis here, and this is f of y given x. I just get some kind of trapezoidal looking uh, density. Okay? Like that. Trapezoidal figure that has an area of one under it. Okay? Everything okay now? Can you see what's going on? Pretty much? So now I find the conditional mean of this. Uh, I find the mean, which is 0 to 1 here. Y. So this is the integral of 0 to 1 y times x plus y over x plus a half dy. Okay, and x plus a half just comes out as a normalization constant. And then I have to integrate x times y, which should give me x, y squared over 2. You get a y cubed over 3. y goes from 0 to 1. And so I simply get the following function. I get x over 2 
plus one third over x plus a half. Zero plus, and this is true for each x between zero and one. It's not a density anymore. This is the condition of mean. This is my h of x, and this is uh, where it makes sense for x between zero and one. So that's a nonlinear function of x for the conditional mean. Now here in this example, the mean is the conditional mean wouldn't help very much. Okay? In other words, if I took the mean of this, well actually I guess it wouldn't be that hard because I just multiply by x plus a half. So notice that if I take the mean of the conditional mean, then this x plus a half cancels this and just integrating a, a, a linear function of x. I guess it would work out well. It's got to work out well. Because see, it's not, it's not any harder than just doing the double integral against the joint density, in other words. Because you've divided by the marginal density, and then you multiply that to take the expectation. You just cancel it. So this can this x plus half will cancel with that x plus half if I try to integrate this. Okay? If I take the expectation of y. So so the expected value of y is then equal to the integral of x plus two a half plus a third over x plus a half. That's the condition on me times the density, f sub x, of x dx, 0 to 1, okay, equals integral 0 to 1, half x plus a third, dx, because this is equal to that, this x plus a half is equal to that, x, which is equal to, what, uh, half times a half plus a third equals 4 plus a third. Four and three times the seven twelfths. Okay, so that's the mean of y. You see this theorem A. Or I could have just done it straight up. Okay, integrate y against the joint density versus e y equals double integral y x plus y dy dx zero to one zero to one and. You could do the x integral first if you wanted. Okay, so I did the x integral first. I would do we would put the dx dy. If I do the x integral first, I get one half there, so I just get one half y plus y squared integral zero to one dy. And just to make it look a little different, which is one half times a half plus a third, which is again a fourth plus a third, seven twelfths. Okay, so that's verifying it. The theorem again. You can see I'm just defined by x plus half doing one integration. Multiplying back by x plus half doing the other integration. Okay. Anybody, everybody, so, so it's not that big of a mystery. This is the conditional thing. Comments? Questions? Okay. In terms of prediction, what is the conditional mean? You see here, suppose I had to predict y based on my knowledge of x alone. This is what is called the best predictor. If I was going to try to predict y in terms of x, how would I do it? Well, it seems like kind of, you know, it might seem like kind of a silly, you know, thing to think about uh, in general uh, because there's all these dots here. What do you mean predict y in terms of x? Y is just somewhere in this vertical direction, right? Given x. It's just it's between here and here. What do you mean predict? All right. Well, <laughs> um, well, it still has a meaning. So in other words, what what curve can I draw through here so that I do actually get the best best prediction in terms of what sense? So the best predictor of y as uh, 
a function of x. So let's call it c of x. Okay, c of x is my best predictor. What should what it should mean by best? Okay, the meaning is. Do we need to close the door? Meaning, what I will do is I will take the difference between my variable y and my c of x, which I'm going to use to predict y, and I'll square it. And I'll say, I want this is, this is minimized, meaning this is minimized over all possible functions c of x. So what would that mean in terms of functions, functions, c of x. So c of x is a function. So I'm going to make a curve, right? And I'm going to try to predict. So what would it mean? This is the least squares criterion. Because what, the, what does that expectation mean? That's a, that means um, average over all the dots that e, if you want to think about it. Okay. So you're, that's really all the E means. It means average over all the dots. That's how we can interpret it. Interpret it. F of x, y, this means you, you take into account how many dots are in a little space. Okay, this is what the F x, y does. But then, all right? So, so that's just the least squares criterion. I'm going to take the difference between the height of the curve and the height of the y excuse me, the height of the dot, okay? That's the height of the dot, which is y, minus the height of the curve, which is c of x, all right? And I'm going to square, and I'm going to add up over all the dots, okay? And then, of course, divide by the total number of dots for average. But in the same, you know, if I only had a million dots, it would be the same thing as just taking the sum of the square deviations and minimizing that over all possible functions. Okay? So it's a little bit like linear regression. Yeah, except this is the best possible curve, okay? So the claim is the best possible curve is just simply this conditional expectation. Claim. The best overall predictor is c of x equals expected value of y given and that's kind of intuitively clear because um, that's just a, how, well, it's based on the following fact. Suppose I just had a function, I just had one variable. Maybe you think of just the dots in a vertical column, okay? That's just one variable, y, right? Or y given x, if you want, okay? I just have, what's the best uh, number to predict? Y by if I just had to predict a variable. One that has the least error. I mean, in the least squared sense. Yeah, but if, yeah. What, if, uh, if I have a variable Y here, okay, and just a bunch of dots, okay? So I'm going to take that column of dots and make it into a row, okay? And just put it on the Y axis, okay? And maybe there's more dots over here or whatever, okay? So it's going kind to of spread out like this, okay? So there's my dot diagram, right? What would be the best predictor of y? In the sense of least square error. I, in other words, I'm going to take each, I'm going to take one number. I want to get one number. I can take one number c, okay? And then I'm going to minimize the, the sum of square root of, of distances, okay? What's the best predictor? Maybe the expected value of y. Yeah, that's it. So the fact based on following fact that if I take the minimum of e of y minus c squared, okay, of all possible constants c, that's just the, the c is the mean, right, and the minimum is the variance, the minimum of uh, the least square, the minimum quantity that I'm minimizing is the variance. So this this comes out to be e of y 
minus u sub y, okay, squared. Okay. So c equals mu y is the answer. So that's why that's another interpretation of the mean is the is the uh, the thing that solves the the least squares problem. Okay. Now let's see. Is it clear that that should be the case? Right. That's, that's kind of physically obvious. Okay. The center of mass. Okay. Well, let's check that. Let's say how would you do it? How would you check that the this is true. What's the point of this? What's the point of this? Is to verify this theorem here. Okay. This theorem here. I'll call it a theorem oh. and I'll give it a name from the book. Okay? That the best predictor is that. So it's an interpretation of the conditional expectation in terms of best possible predictor. Then what we'll do is going to consider best possible linear predictor. And that's going to get us back into covariance and correlation. Okay? So let's see. This theorem is not stated as a theorem. It's stated on the bottom. It's stated uh, just before example A on page 153, or it's right on the top of page 53. So he's talking about the minimum. Okay. Now let's consider predicting y by some function h of x in order to minimize this. He calls it this the MSE mean square error. Okay. Then what you do is you square the error and you take its mean. So that's called the mean squared error. <laughs> okay. Top page 153. So what I'm doing is I'm looking at that. He's, he's going forwards and I'm going backwards. In other words, I'm saying that this problem from that picture it relates back to this problem. Okay, and he's, he's on the very top of page 153, he's arguing what this is. That this problem is solved, c equals the mean. That's a fundamental thing, uh, interpretation of the mean. Okay? Fundamental interpretation of the mean is that it minimizes this um, mean squared error. <coughs> error for predicting a variable by a constant. If I needed to predict a variable by a constant, what constant should I pick? The mean. Okay, that's the theorem. The little baby theorem. And then we can jack it up to this theorem, that if I want to predict y as a function of x, or the joint distributed, okay, then the best predictor in terms of mean squared error is the conditional mean of y through x. It's just almost the same theorem. <laughs> So let's verify that the mean squared error for predicting a, variable, a single variable by a constant is minimized by taking the constant equal to the mean. Let's just check that little computation. You've probably seen it, or you probably believe it, certainly, but let's just double check that. How would I do that? I would, I would take the objective function, which is just a quadratic function in C, and take its derivative with respect to C and set it equal to zero. This comes out to be expected value of y squared minus 2cy plus c squared. The author does it a little bit different. He uses the general principle how to calculate an MSC is the variance plus uh, the bias squared. <coughs> I can do it that way as well. But I'm just going to do it this way. This is e of y squared minus uh, 2c, I'll just call it mu, plus c squared. Okay. That's my objective function. The mean squared error is a function of c. Now I want to minimize it as a function of c. MSE. Right? This is a simple thing. 
I, you seem to be resisting my attempts to do it, is all. <laughs> it's like, why is he doing that? Don't do that. Why are you doing that? Okay. <laughs> well, I'm starting to wake you up a little bit. Okay, so this is the, the, the MSC. Now, as a function of C, d by dc of this MSC, okay, then it's just 2c minus 2 mu, and there's a constant. E, why, why is this some fixed variable? So that comes up the root of zero. So that equals zero if and only if c equals mu. That's what I wanted. Okay, this, 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 this quadratic function of c is obviously not negative because it is uh, given as a non negative quantity, expected value of a square. All right? So it's not negative, so that means what well, the minimum of the quadratic function will be obtained. Okay? Probably will open upward as an option to see. So I'm going to do it in the second derivative. <laughs> okay. There you go. So that verifies the claim. And now how do we get this theorem then? This is a theorem. He didn't actually state state it um, as a theorem. Because he just doesn't. Or the author doesn't. Um, so how would you get that now? So then you would look at that the expected value of y minus c of x in general, okay, squared. Okay, how would I calculate that? That, that would be now a double integral, okay? I'll, I'll do the conditioning argument. Or maybe we can just do the conditioning argument. Yeah. Here I'll, I'll do it this way. Yeah, I'll just write it this way. The expectation, the conditional expectation of y minus c of x, the quantity squared, given x. Okay? Or, like that, that's even better. Okay. Now, what, what I claim is to, to to calculate the minimum of the total uh, expectation. If I can minimize this inner quantity for every fixed x, all right, then I'll obviously have minimized the whole thing. All right. So I want to find the best function c of x so that this so that this quantity m is e is a small. I need to find a function. Think of take, taking all possible functions, all possible curves you might have here, right? This curve, that curve, whatever, okay? So I have to minimize this overall curves. But what I'll do is that for any particular x here, I'll figure out um, that the inner integral is minimized at a particular x, and that's going to minimize the double integral, okay? I can't do any better if I can minimize this for every x. Okay? So I'll minimize this for each fixed x. And then I'll minimize the whole thing. Okay? So minimized for c of x equal to what I just said, the, the mean. Why? Given x. So that's the proof. Okay. <laughs>
okay? Double integral like that. So that proves it, like that. So if I call c of x the conditional mean, I call c1 of x any other function, because this inner integral is, just, is at least as big as this, okay, integral, for c of x, so for c1 of x, uh, any function, and c of x equal the conditional mean of y given x equals x. The inner integral here is greater than that inner integral. That's what I've said by this, this conditional mean business, okay? And therefore, the double integral, whoops, dx here. And therefore, the double integral is at least as big as that, okay? Because the, you're just integrating whatever the integral, inner integral is against the marginal density. Okay, so if this number is bigger than that number, okay, for any x. But see, this is the minimum for all, for each x, this is smaller. So C1 of X, I can make C1 of X, uh, up, you know, C1 of X go, oh, go make it go up there and so on. Okay, so it's bigger here, but isn't it smaller over here? No, it's, this inner integral is always the smallest. Okay. So point-wise, this integral is bigger than that integral. Every single X. Right, therefore, the double integrals will follow the same inequality. So therefore, this is the minimum. Okay. Okay. So maybe it's worthwhile going through that. So that's the theorem. That's the conditional expectation. It gives you the best predictor. However, you can't always compute the conditional expectation. You can't always get the best predictor. What do you have in a statistics problem? You might have. Normally, what we'll do is we'll we'll. Uh, we have a statistics problem, we'll compute the, the sample means of x and y, we'll compute the, the sample variances, we can compute the sample covariance, or we can compute the correlation. This is common, right? A common procedure. What's the um, best linear predictor? So what I'll do is I'll say, well, I'll now restrict myself only to linear functions. I'll give myself only a class of functions, maybe linear functions or uh, polynomials of degree at most two or polynomials of degree at most three. I can talk about such prediction problems. What's the best linear prediction? What's the best quadratic prediction? What's the best cubic prediction? And so on. Or I could go to some other classes of functions. But those would be typical. Okay? So best linear prediction. So now I have to do a different problem. So this is the regression problem, linear regression problem. What is the best linear predictor? How would I do that? Well, now the MSE. Let's just uh, now I'm just gonna I'm gonna write it y. Okay, I'm gonna write it as. Um, Alpha plus beta x, I think he does. C of x equals alpha plus beta x. I'm just going to consider linear functions. I'm going to have two parameters, an intercept and a slope. And what are they supposed to be? MSE would be there for double interval y minus alpha plus beta x squared. Oops, I don't want to write that. I'll just write this e. Instead of writing integration, I'm going to use the e symbol. Okay, so how should I find alpha and beta? What do you do here? I have two parameters. <laughs> to minimize the mean squared error. What did you do? Did you ever have a statistics course when you did this? You just take the partial derivative with respect to alpha, partial derivative with respect to beta, and set it from zero. Set d by d alpha equal to zero, d by d beta equal to zero. Okay, what do you get? Okay, this is just an integral, and alpha and beta are parameters, so I can differentiate under the integral sign. Okay? So I'll get the expected value. Let's see, I have to take this thing. Oops, 
squares on the outside. Okay? Oh, you need no parentheses. I was missing a set of parentheses. That's what I was missing. Okay? So, y minus alpha plus beta x. How do I, okay, so let's take d by the alpha, y minus alpha plus beta x square it, okay, like that. And this is equal to, let's see, I take the derivative, so I'll get a 2 coming down, y minus alpha plus beta x to the 1 power, okay, times a negative 1 for the derivative of minus alpha, okay, and that's at that equal to 0. So what do you get? You get um, you can get rid of this minus one and the two because they're just constants. So I'm setting equal to zero. I'm just looking at this equation. And what do I get? And then I get e times y minus e times alpha plus beta x. Set that equal to zero. Okay. And then I write that out. So actually, I get. So I'm not using any conditional expectations or anything here. Minus alpha plus beta e x equal to zero. So that's one, that's one equation. I'll call that one. Okay? Then I need a second equation. Uh, this should be a parenthesis here. Okay. Let's do the linear regression problem. What's the other equation I'll get? The other equation I'll get is 2 d by d beta equal to 0, and I obtain um, expected value twice times y minus alpha plus beta x to 1 times. Now it's times a minus x equal to 0. Now I can't get rid of the x because, that, because the x, that's under an integral sign. There's a double integral here. I'm actually taking this function and double integrating it again, the fxy, the joint density. How do you get that negative x from uh, Oh, the derivative respect to beta of uh -huh. minus alpha minus beta uh -huh. s. Okay. What I'm doing is I'm taking d by d beta of y minus alpha minus beta x squared. If I take that, what do I get? 2 times y. I'm putting just a little y because I'm going to be, it's really what I'm thinking is um, I've got this double integral y minus alpha minus beta x. Maybe it would have been better to write it like this. In the long hand, dy dx. I'm taking d by d beta of this. I'm taking the d by d beta underneath the integral signs. Okay? And just, and so I'm doing all of this here. Yeah. So you get 2 y minus alpha minus beta x to the 1 times a minus x. And then I have, that's all the integral sign that I have to integrate against fxy. And so what I'll get is that this expectation is equal to 0 if and only if let's see, I can get rid of the 2 and the minus sign again. But I'll get e now times, so I'll get rid of the 2 and the minus sign. And I get e times xy minus alpha ex plus beta ex squared equals 0. That's equation two. I have one and I have two. How do I solve these equations? Well, um, you multiply the first one by e of x, and then you play with these things. Okay? So if I take one, 
times e of x, what do I get? Is then I get the equation e of x y, e of x times e of y. I'll put equal signs, equals alpha e of x plus beta e of x, the quantity squared. Okay? And then I take 2. 2 is simply um, e of x, y <coughs> equals alpha e of x plus beta e of x squared. Not, not the square of the expectation, but the expectation of the square. All right? So those are the two equations. So now subtract them. 2 minus this other one. And I obtain the covariance between x and y. And that's the, because dxy minus dx times dy is the covariance equals 0 plus beta times the variance of x. So that gives me beta. Beta equals um, covariance between x and y divided by the variance of x. And the alpha then I just obtain by substitution. Plug that in. Okay? Notice though what this gives is that the alpha is chosen so that whatever the beta is, um, EX, well, so let's put it this way. If I put the equal sign here, okay? But this, this tells me that this is EY equals C of EX, right? This tells me EY equals the, the linear function of EX, right? Equals alpha plus, I'll just write, rewrite E of X like this. So this tells me that, and I'm computing the regression line, alpha plus beta X, right? This tells me that the point of means EX, EY, lies on the regression line. In other words, EX gives out EY. So the easy way to figure out what alpha is, instead of plugging back into the equation, is to use this, this equation 1, right? This tells me that, okay, now let's go back to the dots. So I've got my dots picture, right? I'll make another one. Make some goes over and back, back up and stuff like this. Okay, whatever. Okay, now I need the, the, the line. So so my best predictor, alpha plus beta x, which I've just computed, okay, there's some least squares line here. Okay? So here, a point on the line is the point of means. Mu1 <coughs> equals e of x. Mu2 equals e of x equals e of y. Right, this is the y-axis and the x-axis. And this is my picture of joint density. Okay? And so there's the point of means. The line goes through the point of means. And it has slope. Beta equals sigma sub x squared. Excuse me. Sigma sub x y, we'll call it. Or sigma sub x squared. Okay? This is rho, if I put it in terms of correlation, rho sigma x sigma y over sigma x squared. So if I reduce that now, then this becomes rho sigma y over sigma x. Okay, well the slope should have meet, uh, units of y divided by units of x, which it does here now, and this rho is unitless. So that's the slope of the regression line. So the equation of the regression line is y equals, let's see, I have my slope, rho sigma y over sigma x. We might as well put it in the point slope form, right? I'll just put x minus mu 1 here. And then this is y equals mu 2 plus this, right? So then this line passes through the point of means, right? Point slope form, where the point is mu 1, mu 2. y minus mu2 equals rho sigma y over sigma x times x minus mu1. So that's the uh, regression line equation. It has the best, 
that's the best predictor. So it has, if I, the mean squared error is minimized. Now we didn't actually compute the mean squared error. The mean squared error of this prediction turns out to be sigma sub y squared times 1 minus rho squared. I can go through the calculation. Uh, it's reported in the book somewhere, and it's in the notes, which we've run out of time for today. Notes 11. Um, I do it on the bottom of page 5 to the top of page 6 of these notes. Let me give one more example. The last example is, of course, has two exams and so on. Two is discussing the regression paradox. We'll discuss the regression paradox briefly next time. So what about this homework? Are you going to be able to use the theorem A and all this covariance and stuff, do you think? So if somebody needs, remember, everybody gets one late one. So if this, you need to be late on this, I suggest go ahead and do it. And if everybody's late, then I'll put it back. But <laughs> if there's like one or two people late, then everybody gets one late one. Okay? So we'll try that procedure. Okay. It's a long assignment. If, I would say if you don't want to do uh, part E of, maybe I'll just make that extra credit. to give it a little extra um, motivation to get some stuff done. If I think part uh, 52 has part E, repeat parts B through D again. Uh, just make that extra credit or something. If you're running out of time, it's just too, too lengthy. You know, to do the whole thing, just do it for the problem, do it again. Make that extra points. 52E. Okay? Now, is Tuesday considered okay? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. All right, no worries. You know you're going to be like, all right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good enough.